today's guest is Bruce Hughes. He is a stroke survivor. He has had to face something we will all have to face one day. But here he is to tell his story with humor, passion, insight, and something you can't just describe somehow. There's a spark in him that is spectacular. Hope you enjoy the conversation. And partisan politics just in general. I, I, I'm a believer in the independent, you know, candidate. I, I, I often considered that myself, but I think it was like you're only allowed a $100 campaign limit or something. like that. The odds are stacked against you from the beginning and, and, and stacked in favor of the partisan system. But I would love to see me personally... Um, a minority government with, with a third party or third and fourth or and fifth party with a balance of power and force people to compromise and do what's right for the province because let's face it, New Brunswick's been a corporate state for decades, right? And those other provinces have followed secretly, you know, whether it's the Canadian Petroleum Association has watched Irving, uh, the, the media side, I was down there uh, when they crushed the union, basically, the papers didn't really cover it much. Um, there's just been so many studies, and somehow it just keeps happening, just this back and forth, one team to the other. And I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm going, you know, you've let two teams run this province, and we're $14 billion in debt. Hmm. So at what point do you stop going to them and say, we've got to try something else, mm -hmm. right? What are your thoughts on um, those two teams um, being more or less the same? Economic policy, I find mostly uh, the red team seems to have more of a social conscience. Uh, but economically, it's driven. And, and I think back often to when Frank McKenna got out. And his first day in office, he's told the story. I don't know if it's publicly, and I don't really care if it's not. But um, he said the first day he walked always to his office who was sitting in the room waiting for him but the three brothers from St. John. <laughs> you know, basically saying, we run part of the province, you know, the other industrial family runs the other part of the province, and you have your third, and we're here to make sure you don't screw it up. So there's so many people, my family's from St. John, and they're like, oh, wow, you know, lots of job. But, well, that's not how it works, right? A corporation's interest is not the public's interest, hmm. no matter what you think. And that's what we've become in my mind. That's what I see is if it's good for them, it must be good for us. And it's not. We're $14 billion in debt. So, as it, I mean, that's a long-running New Brunswick narrative. Yep. The relationship between a couple of key families yep. in the province and um, the, the running of the province. Bruce Lebsay, who was a guest on the show. Oh, he's um, fabulous. It spoke much the same way. I'm curious to learn, where do you think the breakthrough will occur? Where can we shift the narrative? Where does the solution come from? Because if that's the way it's been for so long, and yet we feel it needs to change, yes. then what is that change? Well, when friends ask me, what can I do? I say, start local, right? Save your river, save your community, uh, get out there, make sure, don't, you know, people think voting every four years is enough. It isn't anymore right? Protesting isn't enough. You have to go take power from them, right? They're not going to give it up. You have to make sure your friend who you trust, you should go into politics. I will back you. I will get people to back you and make sure that candidate is someone that represents your community. Don't let the parties tell you who this guy's a good guy. He'll do what, you know. No, if he's in a party, he's going to do what the party is best for the party. Do you think uh, we could have a functional legislature if they were all independent candidates? Oh, I'm sure there'd be people that would kowtow it to, you know, and poo-poo it and you name it, but you don't know till you try, yeah. right? And I mean, at one time, I think we've had this discussion before, we're not everybody independent, you know, you were just a, an upstanding individual that would represent yeah. your community and say, hey, my community needs a new school, my community needs water, right? And if that community trusted you to represent them mm -hmm. and you got that, by God, they'd vote for you next time, mm -hmm. right? Now it's like, I, I just, the, I guess it's the partisan side that, that really, you know, yeah. you, and it may not be as bad here as some places, but, you know, it's getting that way everywhere. 
right? Do, does it ever strike you that you know New Brunswick's population is seven hundred and fifty to seven hundred seventy thousand mm -hmm. people? Um, geographically, we have proximity to each other, uh, so we're kind of like a suburb in a way, in, mm -hmm. a, in a bigger center. Those suburbs are run by independent candidates sitting on municipal councils. Yeah. And it still works. I know there's different infrastructure challenges and geographic challenges and stuff. But the principle of governance yeah. and population and scale um, means how do we get past that narrative that, no, you have to pick a political party because they win, and when they win, they're in power, and when they're in power, they'll go do these things. These things get done through a cooperative approach as well, because that's what we experience every day at the municipal level. Yeah. So, I, I think a minority could do that. Like, it would force you to get back to the table and say, okay, I can't just bulldoze the place, mm -hmm. so what would you really like to see happen? Well, I can't quite do that, but I might be able to do this, right? And, and you get the conversation going that way. Get away from the politics. Right, get back to the humanity, community side of it. What needs to be done? Delivery. Um, Canadian history tells us most of our progressive legislation happens during minority governments. Yeah, but try and tell people that. You know, the facts are there, but they don't believe it for some reason. Any thoughts as to why that is part of the narrative? Well, because to the benefit of, of uh, the two teams that win, right? you know, they don't want you to know that. Mm -hmm. They want you to think that, no, I'm going to do a real good job of representing you. And those guys have no idea what they're doing. Yeah. And yeah. then they throw them out. And you, you know, and as you know, well, in this country, whether it's federal or provincial, we don't vote for something. We vote out something. Yes. Right. And then you deal with what you have in front of you for the next four years. Yeah. That's got to stop. Another common narrative and myth is that um, you have to be in power to get something done. No. So, so, or you vote for them, you're going to be wasting your vote. Is there such a thing as a wasted vote? Well, whenever I, I get this topic, I remind people that if the 40% or 45%, depending on the election, that didn't vote, got together, they could form a majority government and fix all the problems that they claim they know we have, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, yeah, I would say there's a lot of wasted votes. Um, now, in the U.S. election, you know, between the lesser of two evils sort of thing, they somehow managed to even make it worse, in my opinion. But I, I think we have to get back to some type of... Uh, civics you know the, like i know at the school i was at one of the elementary teachers started a citizenship program for like in grade two and teach them how to be a good community person and teach them what civics is about it's not just about elections it's about helping your community giving back um i i just don't buy into this you know i got mine you got to go get yours pull up your bootstraps kind of thing like if i've got plenty and my neighbor's hurting, I'm going to go help my neighbor. And, and I, I don't know why we've gotten away from that. You know, it's like, oh, well, that's their problem, right? You know, and I'm like, really? Uh, and I mean, call me socialist, call me whatever, but I see humanity as a community, not a collection of individuals, right? And uh, I've just always approached life that way, you know. My two best friends growing up, one was a Maliseet Indian, one was uh, from India that came over here with his parents. And they got called horrible names, and I would help them beat up white guys. You know, like, I mean, I would just, they would cry, and it would make me cry and angry. That, why are you, they're really nice guys. So I never, in my mind, had a prejudice bone in my body. And I kind of look at politics the same as, like, what do you mean I can't talk to him because he's on the other team? You know, that's a guy I need to talk to because he's in the riding next door to me. And we've got a, a problem that's cross-border you know uh so it's just at one time i i considered public service and i got approached by a few parties but uh i don't know if i've got the skin for it now because i would and and since my stroke i i know i was uh speak a little more freely yeah. so to speak but but maybe that's something we should all do a bit more maybe it needs to come from that deeper more powerful place if, if you can contain it or control it a little bit because uh, like 
it helps keep my blood pressure down that I don't pay attention so much now. And uh, another journalist, I had promised him an interview months ago, and he contacted me on the weekend, and I had forgotten all about him, but he wanted to do it when my speech wasn't very good, and he wanted to do it over the phone, and I'm like, nah. And half an hour of talking to him and my blood pressure I could tell and I said enough I'm like this is why I don't yep. get into it too much anymore but with someone like you where I've had a few discussions over the years it's kind of fun and and part of the pleasure of the show is that we're not going to spend all the energy defining the problem no we're going to get on with what do we need to change where does this shift occur how do we help people see their way through this so part of it is the 40 percent that don't vote need to kind of get engaged you've got many choices to do it yeah and then there's the age-old narrative that you know new brunswick doesn't uh doesn't do anything new when it comes to its politics stories of uh, oh the hand of the grandmother or the grandfather comes out of the grave on election time and tells the grandchild you know this is how you're supposed to be voting family voting yes like it's is it done yet are we finally past it have we reached a new critical mass or a new critical point in time that for all the challenges we have in front of us that are going to take cooperative approaches mm-hmm. rather than the the way we've been doing it. I mean, the Premier made more announcements this past week. They'll be rolling out announcements oh, right up election until election year. time. Yeah. And I'm thinking that's part of the problem because it teaches people that this is how we fix the problem. And yet it's the same approach we've had for 40 years and nothing's changed. You know, Stats Canada shows our unemployment rate went up a tick and there's been a huge shift towards part-time jobs from... Well, I could have read that in the 80s. Yeah. And yet the political solution that we're being provided as a choice is this. And that's what mainstream media covers as part of the narrative. We, we've, how do we shift away from that? Which means we got to maybe disregard mainstream media. People have to get more engaged. Yes. The engagement, education, and we need to kind of go back to that uh, front porch, right? Rather than back porch. Um you got to go start talking to your neighbors again, you know, find out, find out what they need. And if you have a similar need, then, and you know something, but just so so many people are turned off that, oh, they're all the same. Well, they aren't all the same, right? I've, I've interviewed and I've known tons of friends that have been uh, politicians, cabinet ministers, federally, provincially, you know, really good people. You know, you're not going to tell me they're just like every other politician because I've seen them in action, right? But if you have that cynical view going in, is your mind ever going to be changed? You know, maybe maybe, maybe it's good they don't vote. I don't know. But I would like to see more engagement. And I thought it would get better as I get older, but I, I, it's not. Like in my mind, it's not. And I don't know if that's because of our education system, the media, as you say, Um I just don't understand because I, I've always had a passion for it about wanting to do better for your community or your, you know, public service or whatever. I really truly believe in it. Um, now my libertarian friends, you know, they're like, oh, you know, I, I want my taxes. I'll take care of my health. I'll take. It. Well, I asked my American friends because we were playing at the festival this summer uh, when they were coming to the hospital to visit me. I said, just out of curiosity, I said, when you go home today. Do, do an analysis of what this would cost me if I lived over where you were. And he came back the next trip and he said, just the procedure and the care you've had now, not even started, I hadn't started rehab at the time. He said, well, you'd be about a quarter million dollars, right? So I'd be basically bankrupt. I have to sell my house. You know, catastrophic injury would lead to catastrophic loss and my wife and I'd be living out of a car, you know? So we have some advantages, and I, I don't want to totally crap on the system, but people need to pay attention a little more. You know, instead of just griping, it's the old thing like when I was in school, don't just bring me the problem, bring me a solution too. And maybe it's not the right solution, but at least it's something we can talk about and work on, and then maybe we'll come to the conclusion that, well, that's not quite the solution we need, but yeah, that's a step, yeah. you know? And just getting some more people engaged, you know? good people yeah time to wrap up how would you like to send that was us quick off? yeah <laughs> how'd, you, how'd you like to send us off um well for starters i i, I would get in big trouble if i didn't share this time is brain 
right? For every minute of a stroke, um, 10 million brain cells, right? So, so if you think or your spouse or whatever thinks you're having a stroke, 911 immediately because every minute is 10 million brain cells. And they're the, uh, what do they call them, the schematics or whatever, it's called fast, facial droop, um, arm, tingling and numbness in your arm, speech, and then T is for time. And that's why I say time is brain. So don't hesitate because this procedure, and I think it's 10 or 15% they estimate can benefit from this new procedure. It is a game changer. And I'm living proof that you can come back from, and I had a pretty, uh, they don't know how many strokes I had, but pretty severe situation. And our healthcare system figured out a way to put it, me back together and I'm coming back. So yeah. I have to thank them for that. And you know, Dr. Boma, uh, she's the one who said, don't forget time is brain and the fast. So those are, those are the things I'd like to leave. And, and just to thank uh, everybody that supported me, you know, to this point, you know. And thank you for having me in, Dennis. It's All been right. really good to see you again, man. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. No problem, anytime. And thank you for watching. Be good, have fun, love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.